Chapter 5, Part 1 of Aircraft and Submarines by Willis J. Abbott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Tomko. The Development of the Airplane, Part 1. The story of the development of the heavier-than-air machine, which were called aeroplanes at first, but have been given the simpler name of airplanes, is far shorter than that of the balloons. It is really a record of achievement made since 1903, when the plane, built by Professor Langley of the Smithsonian Institution, came to utter disaster on the Potomac. In 1917, at the time of writing this book, there are probably 30 distinct types of airplanes being manufactured for commercial and military use, and not less than 50,000 are being used daily over the battlefields of Europe. No invention, save possibly the telephone and the automobile, ever attained so prodigious a development in so brief a time. Wise observers hold that the demand for these machines is yet in its infancy and that when the end of the war shall lead manufacturers and designers to turn their attention to the commercial value of the airplane the flying craft will be as common in the air as the automobiles at least on our country roads the idea of flying like a bird with wings the idea basically underlying the airplane theory is old enough almost as old as the first conception of the balloon before hydrogen gas was discovered in an earlier chapter some account is given of early experiments with wings no progress was made along this line until the hallucination that man could make any headway whatsoever against gravity by flapping artificial wings was definitely abandoned there was more promise in the experiments made by sir george cayley and he was followed in the first half of the nineteenth century by half a dozen british experimenters who were convinced that a series of planes presenting a fixed angle to the breeze and driven against it by a sufficiently powerful motor would develop a considerable lifting power. This was demonstrated by Henson in 1842, Stringfellow in 1847, Wenham, who arranged his planes like slats in a Venetian blind and first applied the modern term aeroplane to his invention, and Sir Hiram Maxim, who built in 1890 the most complicated and impressive-looking plane the world has yet seen. But though each of these inventors proved the theorem that a heavier-than-air machine could be made to fly, all failed to get practical results because no motor had then been invented which combined the necessary lightness with the generation of the required power. In America, we like to think of the brothers Wright as being the true inventors of the airplane and indeed they did first bring it to the point of usefulness and alone among the many pioneers lived to see the adoption of their device by many nations for serious practical use but it would be unjust to claim for them entire priority in the field of the glider and the heavier-than-air machine Professor Langley preceded them with an airplane which, dismissed with ridicule as a failure in his day, was long after his death equipped with a lighter motor and flown by Glenn Curtis, who declared that the scientist had solved the problem, had only the explosive engine been perfected in his time. Despite, however, the early period of the successful experiments of the Wrights and Professor Langley, it would be unjust for America to arrogate to herself entire priority in airplane invention. Any story of that achievement which leaves out Lilienthal, the German, and Pilcher, the Englishman, is a record in which the truth is subordinated to national pride. Otto Lilienthal and his brother Gustav, the two, like the Wrights, were always associated in their aviation work, had been studying long the problem of flight when, in 1889, they jointly published their book, Bird's Flight as a Basis of the Flying Art. Their investigations were wholly into the problem of flight without a motor. At the outset, they even harked back to the long-abandoned theory that man could raise himself by mere muscular effort and Otto spent many hours suspended at the end of a rope flapping frantically a pair of wings before he abandoned this effort as futile. Convinced that the soaring or gliding of the birds was the feat to emulate, he made himself a pair of fixed, bat-like wings formed of a light fabric stretched over a willow frame. A tail, composed of one vertical and one horizontal plane, extended to the rear, and in the middle the aviator hung by his armpits in an erect position. 
With this device he made some experimental glides, leaping from slight eminences. With his body, which swung at will from its cushioned supports, he could balance and even steer the fabric which supported him and accomplished long glides against the wind. Not infrequently, running into the teeth of the breeze down a gentle slope, he would find himself gently wafted into the air and would make flights of as much as three hundred yards, steering to either side or rising and falling at will. He was even able to make a circuitous flight and return to his starting place, a feat that was not accomplished with a motor-driven airplane until years later. The Leienthal achieved it with no mechanical aid except the wings. He became passionately devoted to the art, made more than 2,000 flights, and at the time of his death had just completed a motor-driven airplane which he was never able to test. His earlier gliding wings he developed into a form of biplane with which he made several successful flights, but met his death in 1896 by the collapse of this machine, of the bad condition of which he had been warned. Le Leienthal was more of a factor in the conquest of the air than his actual accomplishments would imply. His persistent experiments, his voluminous writings, and above all, his friendly and intelligent interest in the work of other and younger men won him a host of disciples in other lands who took up the work that dropped from his lifeless hands. In England, Percy S. Pilcher emulated the Lilienthal glides and was at work on a motor-propelled machine when he was killed by the breakage of a seemingly unimportant part of his machine. He was on the edge of the greater success, not to that moment attained by anyone, of building a true airplane propelled by motor. Many historians think that to Lilienthal and Pilcher is justly due the title, The First Flying Men. But Le Bris, a French sailor, utterly without scientific or technical equipment, as far back as 1854, had accomplished a wonderful feat in that line. While on a cruise, he had watched an albatross that followed his ship day after day, apparently without rest, and equally without fatigue. His imagination was fired by the spectacle, and probably having never heard of the punishment that befell the ancient mariner, he shot the albatross. I took the wing, he wrote later, and exposed it to the breeze, and, lo, in spite of me, it drew forward into the wind. Notwithstanding my resistance, it tended to rise. Thus I had discovered the secret of the bird. I comprehend the whole mystery of flight. A trifle too sanguine was Sailor Le Bris, but he had just the qualities of imagination and confidence essential to one who sets forth to conquer the air. Had he possessed the accurate mind, the patience, and the pertinacity of the rights, he might have beaten them by half a century. As it was, he accomplished a remarkable feat, though it ended in somewhat laughable failure. He built an artificial bird, on the general plan of his albatross. The wings were not to flap, but their angles to the wind were controlled by a system of levers controlled by Le Bris, who stood up in the basket in the center. To rise, he required something like the flying start which the airplanes of today get on their bicycle wheels before leaving the ground. As Le Bris had no motor, this method of propulsion was denied him, so he loaded the apparatus in a cart and fastened it to the rail by a rope knotted in a slip knot, which a jerk from him would release. As they started, men walked beside the cart holding the wings, which extended for twenty-five feet on either side. As the horses speeded up, these assistants released their hold. Feeling the cart try to rise under his feet, Le Bris cast off the rope tilted the front end of the machine, and, to his joy, began to rise steadily into the air. The spectators below cheered madly, but a note of alarm mingled with their cheers, and the untried aviator noticed a strange and inexplicable jerking of his machine. Peering down, he discovered, to his amaze, a man kicking and crying aloud in deadly fear. It was evident that the rope he had detached from the cart had caught up the driver, who had thus become, to his intense dismay, a partner in the inventor's triumph. Indeed, it is most possible that he contributed to that triumph for the ease and steadiness with which the machine rose to a height estimated at three hundred feet suggests that he may have furnished needed ballast, acted in fact as a tail to the kite, 
Humanity naturally impelled De Brice to descend at once, which he did skillfully without injuring his involuntary passenger and only slightly breaking one of the wings. Had Le Brice won the success twenty years later, his fame and fortune would have been secure. But in 1854, the time was not ripe for aeronautics. Le Brice was poor. The public responded but grudgingly to his appeals for aid. His next experiment was less successful, perhaps for lack of the carter, and he ultimately disappeared from aviation to become an excellent soldier of France. Perhaps had they not met with early and violent deaths, the Lilienthals and Pilcher might have carried their experiments in the art of gliding into the broader domain of power flight. This, however, was left to the two Americans, Orville and Wilbur Wright, who have done more to advance the art of navigating the air than all the other experimenters whose names we have used. The story of the Wright brothers is one of boyhood interest gradually developed into the passion of a lifetime. It parallels to some degree the story of Santos Dumont, who insisting as a child that man flies finally made it a fact. The interest of the Wrights was first stimulated when, in 1878, their father brought home a small toy called a helicopter, which, when tossed in the air, rose up instead of falling. Every child had them at that time, but curiously, this one was like the seed which fell upon fertile soil. The boys went mad, as boys will, on the subject of flying, but unlike most boys, they nurtured and cultivated the passion, and it stayed with them to manhood. From helicopters, they passed to kites, and from kites to gliders. By calling, they were makers and repairers of bicycles, but their spare time was for years devoted to solving the problem of flight. In time, it became their sole occupation, and by it, they won a fortune and worldwide fame. Their story forms a remarkable testimony to the part of imagination, pertinacity, and courage in winning success. After years of tests with models and with kites controlled from the ground, the brothers had worked out a type of glider which they believed, in a wind of from 18 to 20 miles an hour, would lift and carry a man. But they had to find a testing ground. The fields near their home in Ohio were too level, and their firm, unyielding surface was not attractive as a cushion on which to light in the event of disaster. Moreover, the people round about were getting inquisitive about these grown men fooling around with kites and flying toys. To the last, the Wrights were noted for their dislike of publicity, and it is entirely probable that the sneering criticisms of their level-headed and practical neighbors had a good deal to do with rooting them in this distaste. Low, steep hills down the sides of which they could run and at the proper moment throw themselves upon their glider, a sandy soil which would at least lessen the shock of a tumble, and a vicinage in which winds of 18 miles an hour or more as a normal atmospheric state were the conditions they sought. These were found at a little hamlet called Kitty Hawk on the coast of North Carolina. There, for uncounted centuries, the tossing Atlantic had been throwing up its snowy sand upon the shore, and the steady wind had caught it up, piled it in windrows, rolled it up into towering hills, or carried it over into the dunes which extended far inland. It was a lonely spot, and there, secure from observation, the Wrights pitched their camp. For them it was a midsummer's holiday. Not at first did they decide to make aviation not a sport, but a profession. To their camp came visitors interested in the same study, among them Chanute, a well-known experimenter, and some of his associates. They had thought to give hours at a time to actual flight. When they closed their first season, they found that all their time spent in actual flight footed up less than an hour. The Leienthal, despite all he accomplished, estimated that he, up to a short time before his death, spent only about five hours actually in the air. In that early day of experimentation, a glide covering 100 feet and consuming 8 or 10 seconds was counted a triumph. 
but the season was by no means wasted. Indeed, such was the estimate that the Wrights put upon it that they folded their tents, determined that when they returned the year following, it would be as professionals, not amateurs. They were confident of their ability to build machines that would fly, though up to that time they had never mounted a motor on their aircraft. In the clear hot air of a North Carolina midsummer, the Wrights used to lie on their backs, studying through glasses the methods of flight of the great buzzards, filthy scavenger birds, which, nonetheless, soaring high aloft against a blue sky, are pictures of dignity and grace. Bald eagles, ospreys, hawks, and buzzards give us daily exhibitions of their powers, wrote Wilbur Wright. The buzzards were the most numerous and were the most persistent soarers. They apparently never flapped, except when it was absolutely necessary, while the eagles and hawks usually soared only when they were at leisure. Two methods of soaring were employed. When the weather was cold and damp, and the wind strong, the buzzards would be seen soaring back and forth along the hills or at the edge of a clump of trees. They were evidently taking advantage of the current of air flowing upward over these obstructions. On such days, they were often utterly unable to soar, except in these special places. But on warm, clear days, when the wind was light, they would be seen high in the air, soaring in great circles. Usually, however, it seemed to be necessary to reach a height of several hundred feet by flapping before this style of soaring became possible. Frequently, a great number of them would begin circling in one spot, rising together, higher and higher, till finally they would disperse each gliding off in whatever direction it wished to go. At such times, other buzzards, only a short distance away, found it necessary to flap frequently in order to maintain themselves. But when they reached a point beneath the circling flock, they began to rise on motionless wings. This seemed to indicate that rising columns of air do not exist everywhere, but that the birds must find them. They evidently watch each other, and when one finds a rising current, the others quickly make their way to it. One day, when scarce a breath of wind was stirring on the ground, we noticed two bald eagles sailing in circling sweeps at a height of probably 500 feet. After a time, our attention was attracted to the flashing of some object considerably lower down. Examination with a field glass proved it to be a feather which one of the birds had evidently cast. As it seemed apparent that it would come to earth only a short distance away, some of our party started to get it but in a little while it was noted that the feather was no longer falling but on the contrary was rising rapidly it finally went out of sight upward it apparently was drawn into the same current in which the eagles were soaring and was carried up like the birds it was by such painstaking methods as these coupled with the mathematical reduction of the fruits of such observations to terms of angles and supporting planes that the wrights gradually perfected their machine the first airplane to which they fitted a motor and which actually flew has been widely exhibited in the united states and is to find final repose in some public museum study it as you will you can find little resemblance in those rectangular rigid planes to the wings of a bird but it was built according to deductions drawn from natural flight the method of progress in these preliminary experiments was by repeated tests to determine what form of airplane and of what proportions would best support a man it was evident that for free and continuous flight it must be able to carry not only the pilot but an engine and a store of fuel as well having as they thought determined these conditions the wrights essayed their first flight at their home near dayton ohio it was a cold December day in 1903. The first flight, with motor and all, lasted 12 seconds. The fourth, 59 seconds. The handful of people who came out to witness the marvel went home jeering. In the spring of the next year, a new flight was announced near Dayton. The newspapers had been asked to send reporters. A crowd of perhaps 50 persons had gathered. Again, fate was hostile. The engine worked badly, and the airplane refused to rise. The crowd dispersed, and the newspaper men, returning the next day, met only with another disappointment. These repeated failures in public exhibitions resulted in creating general indifference to the real progress that the Wrights were making in solving the flight problem. 
while the gliding experiments at Kitty Hawk were furnishing the data for the plans on which the tens of thousands of airplanes used in the European war were afterwards built, no American newspaper was sufficiently interested to send representatives to the spot. The people of the United States were supremely indifferent. Perhaps this was due to the fact that superficially regarded the machine the Wrights were trying to perfect gave promise of usefulness only in war or in sport. We are not either a warlike or a sporting people. Ready enough to adopt a new device which seems adapted for utilitarian purposes, as is shown by the rapid multiplication of automobiles, we leave sport to our professional ball players and our military equipment to luck. End of The Development of the Airplane, Part 1 Recording by William Tomko